sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron. Chapter 20, Dire Circumstances. Animals scattered from their perches as brilliant red lightning illuminated a forest and a man that stumbled out from the storm. Artemis's feet hit soft, grassy earth, and he caught himself against a tree, looking around with a laugh. He could hardly believe it. With the simple push of a button, he had stepped into another world, another time. He ran his palm against the trunk he was leaning against, testing whether this was all a dream. But as the rough bark of the old cedar tree tore at his hand, excitement jolted through his body. He straightened up, listening to the sounds of birds and squirrels chattering away with one another at the intruder in their forest sanctuary. Vibrant green moss covered just about everything, from rocks to the overhanging branches where it draped over them like laundry left to dry in the sun. It was real. Artemis closed his eyes and breathed in deep through his nose. The air smelled of rich pine and petrichor. The half-elf truly was from another reality. He took a few hesitant steps away from the protective tree, feeling the damp mist on the air and the snap of twigs underfoot. The red glow pulsed again behind him, winking out of existence as Artemis turned. Eric was standing beneath a large opening in the canopy, bathing in the sunlight of the warm afternoon. This is where you're from? Quickly undoing the buttons of his parka, Eric nearly shrugged the thing off to let in the humid air, to feel home once more. And he didn't have to ask the stars, or a god, or the north-facing moss to know he had made it. He closed his eyes and breathed in that woodsy scent, the only forests he'd ever love. A bird called overhead, rustling the branches as it took flight, pulling Eric back into the moment. I mean, uh, this is the Cascade Mountain Range. He smiled as he approached a particularly large cedar tree. I grew up not too far from here. With the machine, he could achieve pinpoint accuracy when traveling through time, instead of relying on the whims of the gods, or as Lyra claimed, his own subconscious. Science one, magic zero. Artemis placed his hand on the same monolithic cedar. I've never seen forests like this, and it's so green. He looked up, spying a sky bluer than any he'd ever seen peeking through the gaps in the canopy. So that means it worked. He swung his attention to the half-elf. And you're sure you can get me home as well? Oh, of course. Eric pushed a convincing smile on his face as he rounded the tree, casting around for anything else to focus on. He had promised the necromancer that, after setting his own path right, they would go back to Artemis's past, to before Bosleybert had died. He stumbled over a root, crashing through some bushes, the guilt of his lie growing heavy in his gut. Eric hadn't told the necromancer that if he was successful here, he and his friend would likely cease to exist. But so would the person Eric had become now. He froze, a transient sense of existential crisis rolling over him. He knew it was stupid, that once the event was fixed, he would neither realize nor care he had ever become something different. But he couldn't help lament the loss of knowledge. Perhaps if, by some fluke, he continued to exist as he was now, in the new timeline, he could make good on that promise. He could always build another machine. Is that a world bridge? Eric stirred from his spiraling thoughts at that odd turn of phrase. He glanced around, his eyes landing on the object in question. A swirling portal set between two trees like a doorway. It had taken him years of searching, countless hours of reading his father's old journals and maps to piece together where he had gone. And this was it, the same portal that he and Vel had taken to find their dad. A hesitant smile flickered across his face. Yeah, it is. 
Artemis tore his gaze from the gateway to look back to the half-elf. So, uh, you never said exactly why you want to go back in time so bad. He scratched at his eye patch, the humidity making him very aware of it. Though there was that bit about the body count you mentioned on the train, he added in a tiny voice. Is this part of that? Rubbing his fingers through his beard, Eric pondered on just how much he wanted the necromancer to know. Um, so, you know that recent cataclysm? The overlapping worlds? Artemis swatted at a beetle crawling up his coat sleeve. No. Oh, that's odd, Eric thought. He shrugged it off after a moment. That meant it hadn't reached as far as he feared. Well... <sighs> I, um, I made a big mistake. Huge, colossal, even. And it resulted in a lot of deaths. He towed the line between lying and omitting the truth, afraid the entire story would fall out of his mouth like it had with his mother. I'm trying to fix that. And if I can stop my dad from going through there... He paused, pointing at the gateway with a frown. Then none of that bad stuff will ever happen. And how do we do that? Eric glanced up at the sky, then down at the shadows cast by what light could filter in. I figure we have a few hours before my dad shows up. Uh, that'll give us time to figure- Hello? A familiar voice rang out over the dense silence of the forest, causing Eric to swear. He grabbed Artemis and hauled him away from the portal, guiding them both to the protective shade behind another massive tree. Walking toward where they had just been was someone Eric would recognize anywhere. They shared the same face, how could he not? Wearing a comically oversized camping pack filled to the absolute brim and a similar bomber's jacket was Zachariah Fairheart. That was his mother's last name, as she absolutely refused to become a smith, so he took hers. <laughs> he laughed at the thought. But seeing his father early to something for a change, Eric realized he didn't actually have a plan on how to stop him. I mean, it's not like he could just walk up to the man and say, Hey, Dad, I'm your son from... He did some quick mental math. Uh, 28 years in the future, and if you go through that portal, I'll end up killing billions of people by accident. Uh, nice jacket, by the way, huh? <laughs> He pinched the bridge of his nose in frustration, scouring his mind for anything that even remotely resembled the shape of an idea. Zechariah approached the two trees, eyes flickering between the glowing rift and his shoddy directions scribbled on a scrap of paper. Anybody there? When only birds and chipmunks answered him, he returned his attention to the map, excitement taking over. Time was running out, and Eric still hadn't cobbled together even a cohesive thought. Why hadn't he planned this ahead of time? The only thing that came to mind over and over again was, what would Vel do? Well, that was easy. His brother would walk up and clock their dad in the face, then drag his unconscious body back home, dropping it on the doorstep. That, well, it was a better idea than his first plan which was hardly a plan at all. Ah, hell. Eric grit his teeth and clenched his fingers into a fist. He couldn't believe he was about to... Zachariah! His resolve crumbled into sand at the sound of his mother's voice. Eric squinted through the trees to see her running, actually running to catch up to his father. Zachariah spun at the sound of his name, freezing like a child caught with their hand in the cookie jar. Olivia? He frowned, lowering his hands. I thought I heard a voice. What are you doing out here? How did you find me? He scanned the space behind her, searching for his two kids. Wait, where are the boys? Anger began to replace the confusion that muddied Eric's thoughts. His mom knew? She knew all this time where his dad had gone. She let him spend years of his life piecing it all together to find him, and she knew? Olivia skid to a stop, her hands falling to her knees as she struggled to catch her breath. 
She took in several deep gulps and stood, sizing up her husband's camping gear, favorite cowboy hat, and the map and compass held in his hands. Wait, you're actually leaving? Really? What about me? The kids? He winced beneath her accusatory tone. Darling, I have to know what's out there. Zachariah swung his arm in the direction of the portal behind him. All the most recent sightings have led here, and you know my theories about their use of extraplanar travel. This could answer all my questions and prove to the scientific community that I am not just some quack. So to prove them wrong, you're going to go through an undocumented rift in the middle of the woods on your own? Olivia sighed. If you really want to set things right, hone your research with scientific data. Here. She stomped her foot in the dirt. Heck, I'll even help you write it and submit the findings. When her husband made no attempt to move, she added, You didn't even say goodbye to the boys. Where are they? In the car. I wasn't going to bring them in here. Olivia closed her eyes with another sigh. You know Eric hates forests and bugs, and I can't deal with his whining right now. At the sound of his mother so casually dismissing his very proven reasons to hate the forests, Eric let out a hurt sound of indignation. Please, just... Olivia opened her eyes, tears prickling the edges of them as she took a few hesitant steps forward, like her husband was a timid animal she'd scare off if she moved too fast. Come home. We can talk about this there and find a better solution than you just wandering off into the woods. Zachariah looked down at the map in his hands, then over his shoulder at the portal. The wind that roamed through the leaves rustled the moss hanging from the branches, beckoning him with sweet whispers. He knew the truth was out there. He knew! But as he turned back to his wife, he also knew he had a responsibility to her and his children. He sighed, his shoulders slumping as he shuffled the last remaining steps to Olivia. You're right, like always. Just give me a few minutes to document the surroundings and take a few notes. He smiled. You go back to the boys and I'll be right behind you. She placed a hand on his cheek. Don't worry, hon. You'll find Bigfoot one of these days. Zachariah chuckled, giving her backside a hearty pat as she turned to leave. He continued to smile after her, but sighed again as he turned back to the portal. Ugh, next time. This... this was it. Eric's fingers shook in excitement. Retrocausality. This was one of those moments Lyra had told him he must choose between action and inaction to actively influence the timeline in order for it to remain the same. But that's not what he wanted. And if he remained still, if he let his father leave with his mom, then everything would change. All the deaths undone, and his brother returned to normal without having to do a thing. A raspy voice blew through the trees to Eric's ears, and at first he didn't register them as words. But then they were repeated and his heart skipped a beat. What are you doing? He swiveled around, expecting the necromancer to be playing a prank, or hell, even Bigfoot. But terror flooded his system when his eyes landed on... No! A giant, rotting stag stood at the edge of the shadows, avoiding the light as it sniffed the air. It was taller than any elk, with six legs instead of four. Flesh and fur swung from its bones as it strode purposefully towards him, horns lowering to catch the lapel of Eric's Hawaiian shirt, pinning him against the large tree trunk. He had seen this creature once before, as a statue in a long-forgotten shrine, twined with her goddess lover. Rivaria? No. The creature backed away, rearing up as it did, and its rotting hide fell loose like a cloak over a towering humanoid frame. An elderly man, body riddled with old battle scars, stood before them. 
the years having withered his powerful muscles into the frail reminder of inevitable age. Two of his forearms reached out and snapped Eric from the ground, pressing him back into the tree. The decaying skull of the stag sat atop the man's head like the hood of his gruesome animal cloak, hardly containing his long, matted, blonde hair. Between the wiry facial hair and beard, blind, sunken eyes glowered at him, and the deteriorating flesh across his cheeks enhanced the terrifying scowl worn on his lips. Artemis, hesitant to intervene, gasped at the sight of the withered god, Obus. Unable to directly see him, the deity could smell the necromancer. He turned his milky eyes in that direction, holding them there for a long moment before he returned his ire back to the half-elf. He sucked in a deep, body-trembling gasp. <sighs> Answer me. He pushed harder. What are you doing Eric felt the power of the god snapping the bark beneath his back, and he winced. You wouldn't see me! So you thought you'd just alter time without supervision? Obus wrenched the creature from the divot in the tree and threw him to the ground before leveling a finger in the direction of the portal. Correct the timeline. He sucked in another soul-filling breath. Now, and I might just let you continue living. Eric looked in the direction of his father. The man was taking photographs of the ground near the rift with a disposable camera, seemingly unaware of the commotion. Perhaps the god did not want to taint the timeline and was masking their presence, a fact he could exploit. No! Obus swung his gaze back down to the elf, growling. You must... Now, Eric was not a brave man, by anyone's standards, but he could argue for what he believed in. You don't understand. If I do, if my dad leaves through that portal, billions of lives will be lost. Oh, I am aware. Obus wheezed. You reek of more death. Than even I. But that is not a decision you get to make on your own. It was almost as if every word pulled from the god's mouth caused him great pain. In stark contrast to the sheer strength his body showed as Eric was lifted to his feet and shoved in the direction of the portal. Fix it. Now. Or what? Obus's expression shifted from a scowling rage to a satisfied grin. <laughs> then you fail. He grabbed the elf with two of his forearms, pinning him against his body as he used a third to snatch the necromancer up by his throat. With the guilty in tow, he began to make for the portal, stomping noisily on each twig and branch in his path. Artemis let out a choked scream, his hands struggling to break the grip around his neck. Wait! Eric struggled, each step taking them closer to his father. Dad! Run! Zachariah froze the sound of breaking branches and muffled voices pulling him to a stop. He spun, seeing the shrouded outline of a hulking figure with antlers and far too many flailing limbs. His heart skipped a beat, and before he could convince himself otherwise, he lurched into action, raising the camera and taking a picture of his first ever encounter with a real live cryptid. 
Eric's attempts to break free doubled with fervor when Obus's hands moved from his shoulders to his neck, causing him to kick and claw at anything he could reach. But the deity didn't slow, hardly registering the assault, just continued his murderous march through the trees until he stopped before that brilliant, shimmering portal. Obus's white eyes glanced down at the half-elf in his grip. If you will not fix this, then I have no choice. Eric struggled against the skeletal fingers wrapped around his neck, squeezing his windpipe and causing his eyes to water. Please, don't were the only words he could force from his lips as his hands fell limp against the crushing grip. Zachariah stared up, eyes going wide with fear as he realized this was unlike any cryptid he had ever heard of. Then his attention shifted to the man held in the creature's grip, one hand reaching feebly out toward him. That jacket, the shock of white in his hair, blue eyes. Your... Struggling to hold on to his consciousness, Eric could only nod as his vision began to darken at the edges. Without another word, the god flung the necromancer through the portal, and then him. His awareness returned to him long enough to see the deity reach out and grasp his father by the throat. He opened his mouth to scream, to beg or plead, but the glittering waves of the portal crashed in around him. And you doubted us? Prince Hollow gave a chortling laugh as he waved at the man on stage, his skin tearing away to reveal thick, reddish-brown fur beneath. Let it be known we are a man of our word. Gods, return the monster to its cage. Winter convulsed, crying out in terror and confusion as his body transformed. Claws sprouted from his fingers as fur replaced his skin. His sparring bucked painfully, reforming with snaps like a gunshot. He snarled in agony as his everything was transformed by the beast. Several guards approached, their spears leveled as they attempted to force the creature back into its enchanted cage. But the wolf only thrashed around violently, ripping the muzzle from its face as it snapped at something unseen on its back. The auctioneer, shifting just out of reach, let out a nervous chuckle. He spoke to the crowd, but kept his eyes on the beast. Let's uh, resume bidding, shall we? Do I hear three thousand? Hands rose among the spectators, each more eager now that they had witnessed just how ferocious such a creature was. The wolf's frenzy only grew more manic as it thrashed and howled. One of the guards rushed forward, ramming his spear into the creature's back. The impact was deadened, reverberating down the shaft and into his shaking hands. He attempted to yank free the weapon, but it remained stuck in the beast, and something dark began to ooze from the wound, spreading across its fur. But it wasn't blood. Winter spun on his assailant, swinging both arms, still shackled together, at the guard, sending him sailing into the crowd below. Shouts and screams erupted from the nobility, but Hollow lifted his arms reassuringly, yelling above the din, Do not worry, (laughs) we have the monster well in hand. He turned, expecting to see his soldiers having executed the perfect containment strategy and was instead surprised to see a fully transformed werewolf encapsulated by roiling shadows. It snapped the cuffs around its wrist like twine and let out a tremendous roar, one that was amplified by magic and caused the ruins themselves to rumble and quake. The crowd panicked, trampling one another as they ran in every direction to flee, buffeting Prince Hollow against the dais, He caught sight of a thin tendril of shadow as it emerged from the wolf's back. It wrapped around the spear, wrenching it free and snapped it in half. He shouted for more guards, for more spears, but his voice was nothing more than a whisper in the sea of screams. 
Following the fleeing bodies, Winter's gaze landed on the auctioneer, and a low growl fell from his throat. He raised a massive arm, claws flexed tight for the kill, when the fate tripped and fell, collapsing into the podium. His attack descended with the speed of a guillotine, and then jerked to the side at the last moment, shattering the stone dais with the force of the blow. The wolf attempted to shake the confusion from his mind, his mouth opening to devour the garishly dressed man, when something tickled his back and he spun. A trio of guards thrust their spears at him, none of them finding success, but distracting him enough that the auctioneer took flight into the panicked mob. He grumbled at the loss of a meal and turned his ire on the men in shiny armor. He howled in rage and charged, opening his maw to clamp down on the nearest guard. But after only a few steps, Winter's feet tripped over nothing, and he skid past the terrified men, sliding across the dais on his stomach. Lucian stared at where the wolf comically came to a stop just inches from the steps and shouted, "'What are you doing? Kill them!' The wolf's mouth pried open like an invisible hand compelled it, and a sound somewhere between a growl and a voice gnarled the word, No! More guards swarmed the stage, forcing the wolf to his feet. They thrust their spears at anything they could reach, which only angered the creature further. But with every attempt to feast upon a soldier, Winter found his attacks, his bites and swipes, pulled or stopped altogether. He took his frustrations out on the surrounding ruins, shattering stone with his fists in anger. In the chaos, Lucian spun to find where he had last seen his brother. Shoving through the terrified socialites, he spotted Varen struggling against the guard with the white plume on his helmet. He grumbled at his brother's ineptitude and grabbed a nearby metal stanchion that had been used to section off the area and smashed it over the soldier's head. Lucian shot Baron an exasperated glare. Get up. We need to leave while they're distracted. He glanced back over his shoulder at the werewolf, doing his best to gnaw the head off a soldier before tossing him to the side in a disappointed tantrum. Ugh, your little friend is as soft-hearted as you are. Wraith was sympathetic, compassionate even. He was doing his absolute best inside the tormented mind of the ravenous creature to keep it from hurting anyone. These people who were indifferent to slavery and the mistreatment of children, they deserved to die. No, that was the rage that surrounded him, burning like molten lead speaking. Not him. He struggled to constrain the beast while simultaneously empowering it, but he was keeping these people safe. His blood boiled, but he managed to calm it every time. He was indeed soft-hearted, until his gaze found Prince Hollow, and that glowing anger crept into his awareness, breaking his resolve. Images of teal fire flashed in his mind. The Fey Prince had backed himself against a wooden door, pounding on it with all his might, Winter crossed the distance, unswayed by the screaming socialites, and snapped up Hollow, slamming him against the door. It shattered upon impact, and he opened his mouth, a voice screaming from a throat that wasn't his. You killed Mama! Wraith had pulled back his control, giving in to the churning hunger within the beast, sinking into the hot fires of retribution. When something massive swung out of the doorway and snapped around the wolf's muzzle. Winter gnashed against the firm hand gripping his upper jaw, but his teeth couldn't puncture the stone-like skin. A hulking figure crouched down, stepping through the shattered doorway, the swords protruding from its back, scraping against the stone like nails on slate. It flung the werewolf aside, as one would with an unruly puppy. The towering figure placed itself between the creature and his prince, reaching over its shoulder to rip free one of the many blades in its back with a grunt. Hollow let out a bloody laugh, catching sight of the wolf as it righted itself. 
<laughs> Let's see you take on the swordsmith, beast. Somewhere along the familiar, squeezing confines of the portal, the world shifted to blinding red, tearing the gateway apart and depositing Eric roughly onto a hard stone floor. What little air was left in his body rushed out as his spine curled around the impact, and he cried out in pain. It hardly registered in the wake of the agony in his mind. He could still see his father's face and the skeletal fingers around his neck. Forcing himself to move, Eric rolled to his hands and knees, searching for the portal. If he could make it back through, he could fight, or bargain, or... something. He spun, shuffling on the floor of a great chamber, but found no sign of the rift. No! He used a large wooden table to climb to his feet, searching again. It has to be here! He was in a gigantic circular study, bookshelves lining the walls, and a massive bed of foul-smelling furs in the corner, all of it surrounded by a glittering dome. He could see the quickly darkening sky, briefly highlighted with jagged bolts of lightning. Howling wind and rain slammed against the countless glass panes, as if the gods themselves were angry. And they were. No just one in particular. But there was no sign of a portal. Eric spied the entrance to a staircase leading down, and he lurched towards it as fast as his body would allow. He gripped the iron railing and nearly fell to his knees at the dizzying sight below. Endless stairs spiraled down beneath him like the twisted descent into hell itself. A hand grabbed hold of Eric's shoulder, and he spun wide-eyed, Whoa, hey, it, it's just me. Artemis raised his hands in peace. Are you all right? He ignored the blood dripping from the open wound on his own forehead. Eric ran a hand through his hair manically. No, I need to get back. He has my dad, but I don't even know where we... His words were cut off when the room flared red for just a moment, followed by a tremendous rumbling as something massive landed on the beautiful mosaic floor just behind them. You intrude upon my home. They spun, Artemis staring up at the elderly god who stood before them like an executioner readying himself for a grim task. He glanced back at the endless stairwell, the books, the floor. Hjortens helictom. This revelation would have had him squealing with delight under different circumstances. They had to be in the topmost tower, a climb of ten thousand steps. It was designed to test the will of those who would make the pilgrimage to determine if they were worthy of the knowledge they sought, or so he read. Eric screamed and sprang to his feet, charging at the deity with raised fists. What did you do with my father? Sniffing the air, Obis swung his milky gaze towards the elf and backhanded him, sending the tiny man crashing into one of the many bookcases. I did what you would not to protect the timeline. At those words, and the pain of his injured spine slamming into the books, Eric shuddered involuntarily. You were supposed to see me! He slammed his fists into the floor. His father, who he had thought to be missing all these years, was actually dead. And it was his own fault. I came all this way to be taught by you. Get up! Artemis struggled to right Eric, to help him to his feet. But something else caught his attention. All of the spilled books from the broken shelves were devoid of ink. Instead, the pages were perforated with raised dots. He looked back to the god, who was staring into the distance as he stalked towards them. You too. Obis gasped, shoving the necromancer away from his prey. He grabbed hold of the elf by his coat and wrenched him off the ground. I'm not worthy of my time cavorting with my sister. She too betrayed hers to get what she wanted. 
Eric's face twisted into rage as he struggled against the iron grip. I had no choice. You turned me away. Again and again. I have been here for weeks. Weeks! His words turned into venom as he all but screamed at the god. Lives are at stake. Lives are always at stake. Obus shook the half-elf, spittle flying from his mouth and the decaying gaps in his cheeks. I am the god of death. His breath rattled. It is my duty to judge those past. You cannot undo the calamity you have caused. He flung Eric away, sending his body crunching against one of the thick, colored panes of glass. His body recoiled as the iron frame rattled beneath the impact, and Eric could taste blood in his mouth. But it only fueled his anger. And why the hell can't I? Because death is final. The god charged him, and Eric raised his arms to shield himself from the attack. But something grabbed him and yanked him out of the way just as Obus's fist hammered straight through the window, letting in a terrible howl from the storm raging outside. Artemis's breaths came shallow as his gaze moved from the glass to the terrifying form of the god standing above them with all the fury of the ancients scrawled across that decaying face. He raised his shaking hands in a desperate plea. We weren't trying to do any harm. Please, it was just one small change. You hypocrite! Eric threw out an accusatory finger. Your own Udodle are proof that death is not the end, and yet you disdain those who would change it? The god's head swung. His breathing labored as he cocked an ear in the elf's direction. He raised a leg, attempting to smash them beneath his boot. But Artemis yanked them both out of the way, and the floor trembled under the attack. They are not dead, but frozen in the moment of passing. You pervert the natural order as my sister did. Eric shoved the necromancer off him and stumbled forward, tripping over his missing toes in his angry advance. Caution had left him, replaced with indignant fury. I am not trying to simply reverse death. I am trying to prevent it from ever happening in the first place. I am undoing what I did. For the first time, the giant paused, then chuckled, a sound like a stone tomb sliding shut. <laughs> What do you think happens when you prune the timeline? <laughs> All those lives now unlived. What is the difference between that and death? Eric paused his tirade. That, that didn't matter, did it? Something cold and dense in his gut began to grow. No. no. No, that isn't the same at all. Obus's hands shot out, snatching the elf by his arms and neck, lifting him high overhead. With a roar, he shoved the man through another glass pane, holding him out over the edge. I am no god of death compared to you. He let one hand go, then another, wheezing with the effort. I should kill you and save us all. The god's third hand let go, leaving Eric to dangle by just a shoulder. Clutching onto the arm with his own trembling fingers, fear and doubt replaced the sudden flare of anger, and the breath vanished from his lungs. His eyes were locked on a snow-covered graveyard some hundred and fifty feet below. 
He kicked and squirmed, struggling to pull himself back inside as stone-sized chunks of ice pelted his face and body. Diony promised me a trial! Please! Anger flared in Obus's belly, igniting his words. I knew you would come. Sensed your presence months ago. Ordered the destruction of that which you sought. His ancient face twisted into grim determination as he breathed heavy. Even that wasn't enough. The grip on Eric's shoulder vanished, and he screamed, digging into the ancient flesh of the god's forearm with his hands, their strength all but vanishing instantly as his blackened fingers slipped over wet skin. Please! Obus only glared at him with those milky white eyes. Then his expression shifted to surprise. Then agony as he stumbled backwards, collapsing to one knee, coughing and hacking as he struggled to breathe. Eric hit the stone floor and immediately scrabbled away from the god, putting distance between them. He paled as he saw Artemis, face screwed up in effort, with blood-covered hands placed against the giant's body. (laughs) Dare! Obus attempted to swat at the man who thought to reap his soul. He sucked in a deep lungful of air and repaid the favor, the dim light of the room shrinking as he assaulted their flesh with the magic of a death god. Pain poured through his body like thousands of claws struggling to break free, and Artemis whirled on Eric. Run! The pair bolted for the staircase, tripping over one another as they reached the first steps. The room rumbled against the god's fury, his hands slamming into anything and everything. (laughs) Diony was a fool to trust you. Consider yourself one step closer to death. They were halfway down to the next landing, struggling to keep their footing as the god's hacking coughs rattled the stairwell. His shadow loomed over them as they fled from more than just his threats. Never step foot in Kun's scope again, you or that necromancer. Opus's voice boomed over the tower, toppling more books and rousing the priests from their slumber to witness his decree. Your end will come swift if you do. Eric cursed his missing toes as he and Artemis stumbled and raced down the ten thousand steps, assaulted by avalanches of ancient books and thundering threats. They never stopped, hardly pausing to catch their breath until they burst out into the stormy night, the temple doors slamming shut behind them as they did. You've been listening to Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron, book five in the series here on Tall Tale TV. If you would like to listen to the entire book in one place, or any of her other novels, you can find them at talltaletv.com slash series, or by following the links in the description. I'm bored. Didn't you bring a book? I finished it already. When's Mom getting back? I have no idea. Why? Want to play a game? No. Here, how about some radio? They was aliens. Oh, I love this song. This music sucks. Here we go. And this is better. Better than your music. This is girly music. (laughs) You listen to girl music. Rock is what Dad listens to. Well, Dad is old. You listen to old person music. Quit it. I'm the oldest. I get to choose. You're the oldest and the dumbest. I am not dumb. And stinkiest. Stop.
Stop it. Stop changing it. No. I'm going to tell mom. I'm going to tell her you're dumb. Ow, did you bite me? There's a dog by my side, a truck that won't stop. Aw, you broke it. No, you broke it by being dumb. Oh man, I hate country. Uh-oh, here comes mom. Just just play it cool, okay? All right, boys, we, uh, why are you listening to country? No reason. No reason. Well, I don't like it, so. <sighs> Anything you both want to tell me? Vel did it. Did not. You're dumb. Your face is dumb. Your stinky butt is dumb. Mom, uh, are you going to let him talk to me like that? Is. Mom, is Eric adopted? Hey. I'm rolling down the back Ooh, road. Me too. Kicking up our tracks. With a loyal dog by my